Well, my name is Ron Clemens. I'm originally from Mansfield, Ohio, um, and I have lived in Cincinnati since 1975. I identify as a gay man, and my pronouns are he, him, his, and they. Oh, you know, I have lived in Cincinnati. You know, I, technically I didn't move to Cincinnati until 1976. Um, I uh, stayed up, I went to school at Miami, so I lived in Oxford after I graduated. Um, and then I was driving back and forth from Oxford to Cincinnati for my job. And then winter came and it was like, we're not doing this. <laughs> I was just out, you know, I was, I was going to the bars, driving back to Oxford at two o'clock in the morning when it was snowy outside and just like, we're not doing that. So I moved to Cincinnati. So this is 2003. So what is that? 47 years? Yeah. 47 years. Well, you know, like I said, it was in well, whatever that would have been when I was 19 years old. Um, no, 1972, uh, 72, 73, something like that. Um, I began to acknowledge that I'm gay. I acknowledge that to myself. I mean, I kind of knew it already, but again, when at that particular point in time, gay was not a word, um, that people used. So I didn't have that word for it. I knew I liked boys, uh, you know, homosexual or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I had had, um, a, you know, I call it a, a recurring dream. And I knew that I was, wasn't quite sure how to tell people, wasn't even sure what to do with that. Cause I didn't know anything about gay bars. I mean, I, it's like, where do you go with this? And I was in college and it was more, it's more of a, you know, I, I, I guess I tend to be a little more, um, I don't call it OCD, but you know, I have to have plant things planned a little bit. So it's like, all right, I'll get through college first, then I will deal with being gay. Now, granted, the whole time I lived in college or lived, lived or worked, not worked, the whole time I was in college, I lived in a men's dormitory. So for four years, I was living in a men's dormitory. Um, it was an RA for the last two, um, trying to figure out my homosexuality and all these naked men are running around. So, you know, that was, <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a plus or a minus, but it, it's how it happened. Um, but I would have this recurring dream where I was walking down the highway, dark highway, and then out of nowhere, this truck would just start to follow me. And it was a very threatening truck. It was a very, you know, almost like a monster truck and not like, you know, the, the, you know, the monster trucks in the, in the, in the tractor pulls and those types of things, but just like this very, um, mean looking, like it meant to do me harm, chasing me down the highway kind of thing. And I would run. And it was one of those dreams where your legs got heavy. So you really couldn't get very far. You're like really struggling, trying to run away from this. And there were off in the distance, there were these honeycombs. And so those would be the places that I would hide from the truck. I would run off the road and go hide in those honeycombs. Um, and, you know, the truck would go by and I would sit there and wait for it to pass. And then I would get out of, you know, get out and then go on my merry way. Well, one day that or one night I was having this dream <clears throat> and same thing, walking down this dark road, the truck comes up and, you know, I started to panic, but then I thought, well, I know exactly what I can do. I will go hide in the honeycomb. So I went, you know, as much as my heavy legs were going to take me. Um, went to escape in the honeycombs. And when I got there, they had been sealed off. Yeah. And, but you know what? I didn't panic. It, in fact, I woke up when they were sealed off and I just laid there and I thought, okay, it's time. I just knew, I knew, I just, I just, in my, in my spirit, I knew exactly what that meant. Um, and I told my roommate the next day, it's like, I'm gay. <laughs> um, and you know, the rest of it is history and, and how it played itself out now. Now, and it's interesting because that particular roommate, um, he actually ended up being gay, but he didn't tell me that until like 25 years later. Um, and you know, I was like, he's like, well, and I, I kind of laughed like we knew in college, how come you didn't know? 
Uh, he's like, well, why didn't you tell me? And it's like, well, that wasn't, you know, that's not my news to tell you. You needed to figure that out. Um, but my senior year, you know, I still had never been to a gay bar, you know, and I had had sex with boys prior to college, but, you know, just it being college and not quite, not trying to, and, and not being able to quite figure out, you know, how to, how to, how to maneuver that in, in a strange place, and particularly in Oxford, Ohio. Um, I just kind of like let it go. Um, and so my, the next year, I was an RA again, and I, was, and I lived over on Western College campus. Um, and the corridor and the men in the corridor that I lived in, for whatever reason, they were all struggling with their sexual orientation and identity. You know, and it just kind of played itself out in front of my face and I, or in front of my eyes. I would just stand there and like, wow. You know, it, 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 I wasn't upset, but these boys would get drunk on Friday night and Saturday nights, hump each other to beat the band, and then have these big fights on Sunday morning about who was really gay and who really wasn't gay. And I mean, it, it, it got to be quite messy. It kind of funny, but also kind of messy. Um, but I always thought to myself, okay, okay, Ron, you're exactly where you need to be. Um, and so it, it actually provided me an opportunity to kind of process and deal with, with, with my own coming out in terms of helping them deal with that. So I got to go, there was a place in Oxford at that particular point in time called Together. Um, and it was a counseling place. And so I went up and um, asked them to come down and talk to the dormitory about homosexuality. And so it was homosexual, they, they, well, there were three of them. One was gay, one was bi, and one was straight. And so they did a little panel and we invited the, the women's dorm over. So we all had this conversation about gayness in, the, in, in you know, gay life in Oxford and just being gay, coming out and things like that. And I did it all under the guise of being an RA and educating the, the public. Um, and I was also, it, well, I was in school and my, my degree was in social work. And so it, one of the things that we used to do in social work classes were, um, oh, I'm gonna blank on what they're called. Um, if I wasn't trying to think about it, I'd be able to tell you, role plays. Um, and so whenever I was the client, I was always dealing with coming out of the closet. So I would talk about being gay and not sure what to do and things like that, you know, and so I would use those as opportunities to, to kind of at least fish for some ideas in terms of what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to deal with this or things like that. Um, of course, nobody had any answers, but at the same time, I think for me, just to be able to say that out loud, and even though it was under the guise of being a, you know, a role play, I was still trying to, to, to glean some information and on some level speaking my truth in a very underhanded way, but I was still speaking my truth. Um, so um, that was always interesting in terms of just the, you know, I never really knew if anybody caught on to that or not, didn't really care. Um, but it also struck me that it was, I mean, I, and I think I came to this realization later because for some reason, there was a belief that you needed to be upset about being gay. You know, it was this terrible, terrible thing and you know, you don't want to be gay. And it's just, I've never had that feeling. You know, even when, when you know, and my, my, and my parents, you know, they didn't throw me a party, but at the same time, they didn't throw me out either. Um, you know, they, they, they were a lot more accepting than I thought that they would be, let me put it that way. Um, so it wasn't a, a, you know, I really didn't hear negative things about it. So, you know, from the larger culture and from friends and peers, I heard negative things, but I never really, I, and still don't, never really felt negative about it. So I never really understood people who get so depressed about it. It's like, of all the things you could be depressed about that you like, you know, like somebody who, who, you know, who's the same, you know, equipment that you do. It's like, seriously. Um, and I still don't understand it. I still don't understand why people would get so upset about things like that. And they talk about the, um, you know, the societal pressure and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then one of the things that has happened here in the past couple of months is, you know, people want to hear from, you know, old queers like me about what their, what life is like and, you know, our opinion and stuff like that. So, um, 
being able to go back and, and talk about that from the from the uh, standpoint of not having the and not really accepting the negativity about that. I mean, and I went through the whole thing of of you know I was supposed to go to a therapist, and then that, when I say supposed to, meaning that was that was that was the script that everybody had. You know, you go to a therapist and you, you get your 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 strokes and you get your 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 your, your positive feedback and you build your self esteem and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and I again, I never really had negative thoughts about it. And when I went, and I, and I actually did go to a therapist, um, and I was at one of the bars that was open at the time, Badlands. And I saw him in the mop, at the bar. Is this a um, bar in Oxford or Cincinnati? Cincinnati. Okay. Cincinnati, it was Badlands, it was on Plum Street. Um, and when he, and I was, it, I was coming, going this way uh, down the hallway, he was coming the opposite direction, and there was this little alcove. He ducked in the alcove and he hid from me. <laughs> I, you know, I was so mad. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I'm paying you all this money about, you know, feeling good about being gay. And you're sitting there and he, and he was one of those there. And I became a therapist. So I, I mean, part of me under, well, in the therapy sessions, he would not say anything. And that's, and that's a technique. You just let the client do whatever they're going to do. He was just very non-interactive. Um, so he wouldn't say anything. And so when I had, and I think I had an, an appointment with him the next week and he just kind of sat there and I, and I fired him. I was like, you know what? You're going to sit here. You're not going to say anything. I saw you and you hid from me. How am I supposed to be getting anything positive from you? And you're hiding who you are when I see you out in the bar. It was just like, I just, that it kind of pissed me off. Um, so I, I, I stopped going. Um, but I also think having grown up during the civil rights era made my coming out a whole lot simpler uh, just from the standpoint of, you know, I was what, in well, 1963, I was 10 years old. So I was watching all this, the, the protest and the, and, the, and the police brutality, you know, them yanking the, the young men and women off of the, the stools and lunch counters and stuff like that. You know, my family was, was um, um, I guess from a, from a political standpoint, active in terms of voter registration, the NAACP, and you know, they're sitting around my grandmother's dining room table trying to figure out how to get people to, to vote and how to get people uh, registered to vote and those types of things. So that's the kind of energy that I grew up with. And, you know, you know, affirmative action, you know, quota systems, all that stuff. So many of the, you know, I got to, ex when I say I got to experience some things in terms of when the labor laws changed and, you know, people weren't allowed to discriminate for position. Well, ideally not allowed to discriminate for positions. Um, you know, my parents became you know, my dad became a foreman in the factory where he worked. My mom became a supervisor where she worked. So, you know, there were those 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 milestones, I guess, that 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 were crossed. So being able to go into those spaces and, and, and get some sense of, of, I guess, accomplishment and some sense of confidence um, uh, and witnessing that with them helped. So when I helped me when I came out of the closet and when I decided to, you know, step foot on the path that, you know, that was obviously waiting for me. Um, it just made it a whole lot simpler. So I just, it just, I'd never had a lot of the, the angst about coming out of the closet that I see a lot of people have. It's like, that's like, that's nothing now. Try being black <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and gay. You know, they really never talked about my uncle. Um, they never bad mouthed him in terms of being gay. Now, his alcoholism, oh yeah, they talked about that a lot. But, you know, and in terms of what he was like when he was drinking, um, but in terms of him being gay, they never really, the family never said anything about it. Now, the community would say things about it, but my family would also get in their faces when they would say things about my gay uncle. So they were very protective of that. So um, so I didn't grow up with the, with the negativity around um, you know, homosexuality and stuff like that. When I did come out, 
you know, my mother was, well, you know, the Bible says, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, well, the Bible says a lot of things. Um, and do you believe the things, all of the things the Bible says, but, oh, but you know, homosexuality is this and this. And it's like, well, you're not going to be happy. And I think some of that was watching my uncle be miserable. Um, but she was never, I mean, they never disowned me. They never, you know, I mean, they were never going to be P-flag parents. But at the same time, they never disowned me. They never told me I was a bad person. They, you know, they, they didn't ostracize me or, you know, make me, you know, sit over in the corner or you know, and just nothing like that. So um, I didn't have I didn't have that kind of stuff to deal with. And, and, it made, and it made it very clear to them. It's like, OK, this is who I am. And if you want me in your life, you're going to have to accept me. And if you cannot do that, then, you, you know, you're. I'm not going to be around. I had gotten, I was in graduate school and I was, I got involved. Well, after, this is after graduate school. I got, I was involved in a relationship. Um, and I told my mother before I told my dad and she kind of made, get, made me um, agree to not tell him. Well, he's going to be upset. And, you know, part of me was like, oh, you know, dads are a whole nother thing than mom. Um, and my dad was never really a, a warm, fuzzy kind of guy. Um, so I, I had not told him and I told, it's like, mm, it's been like seven years, eight years at that point. Um, and so I wanted to come to my, go to my parents for Thanksgiving, I think it was. And I wanted to bring my boyfriend. Um, and my mom was just like, uh, initially, I think she was okay with me being gay on paper. But the reality, just when it would hit her in the face, she was just, it was a whole different ball game. And so when I told her I was going to bring, I wanted to bring him home, she said, oh, no, I don't want you to do that, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, okay, now, but I want you to come home. And it's like, no, I, it's like either you get both of us or you get none of us. And then she was like, and <laughs> This is when I finally figured out that my mother was a little manipulative. She's like, well, if you're going to be like that, I'm going to tell your father. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, I'm going to tell him. If you don't come home, I'm going to tell him. I was like, okay. So I hung up the phone and I went to my partner at the time. I said, I'm taking a little trip to my hometown. I'll be back in a couple of days. <laughs> so I packed a bag got in a car and drove it to Mansfield. Didn't tell my parents I was coming up there. Um, walked in our back door and walked into the kitchen. My mom was standing there. It's like, what are you doing here? It's like, I came here to talk to my dad. And I went in and sat down. He was watching Bowling for Dollars, which is their, you know, their TV show. Um, I said, Dad, I got something to tell you. And I, and I told him. Um, and his response was, the only thing I know for sure is two and two equals four. And I just sat there and I was like, what the hell does that mean? And he was like, all I know is two and two equals four. And it, in years, I mean, years it took me to figure out what that meant. And um, I w and told the story to somebody a couple years ago. Um, and they had told me that that's a very Southern phrase. And that means that you're telling me something I already knew. <laughs> and I was like, Really? And then I, I busted out laughing. I was like, really? Because when I told my mom, she's like, oh, we've known that since you were four years old. And I'm like, really? She's like, oh, yeah, we knew. We, we, we've known for a long time. You know, and, and of course, that initial question is, well, why didn't you tell me? And, and it's really not their news to tell. Um, but they didn't want to, um, I guess they didn't want to hedge their bets and, you know, say something. And then if that wasn't the case, then I'd be heading that direction anyway, because I don't know that they really have an understanding or had an understanding of, of what makes people gay. They just know it's there. And, you know, and I would start to ask my mom questions and sometimes she would be a little more narrow minded than I thought she should be. And, you know, and I would kind of uh, chew on her ankles a little bit about it. She says, well, don't give me a hard time. I, I used to go to he, she shows. I'm like, what are he, she shows? <laughs> I said, what's that? I mean, and, and part of it's like, a he, she, what's a he, she? You know, and then she's like, I, we went to he, she shows when I was younger. And I was like, he, she shows, he, she shows. And I was like, uh, mom, they're called drag shows now. <laughs>
<laughs> so it was kind of like, so it, it, it was never a, a big deal. Um, we had our moments, uh, but at the same time, you know, they, they, they always accepted me. They, they always accepted me. I can't say they always accepted my boyfriend just because, you know, again, you know, on paper is one thing. A boyfriend makes it a reality. And then, you know, she was like, well, if you come to my, if you come up here for the weekend, you can't stay, you can't sleep in the same bed because you're not married. And I'm like, well, you can't get married. So that's really not a fair uh, measure. Because if I can't get married, there's nothing I can do about that. Well, you know, I wouldn't let your brother do that if he's not married to the, to, to and his, his, well, it's now a wife, but um, at the time his girlfriend, um, I don't let them sleep in the same bed. So I'm not gonna let you sleep in the same bed. And it's like, well, I can give you that one just because, okay. But that means that when I come to Mansfield, I'll be staying in a hotel. <laughs> Um, I, I, I guess part of me just, I wasn't going to allow anyone to put shame on, on that. I, I mean, I just wasn't and still don't do that. It's like, keep that away from me because that is not what this is designed for. And it, you know, and it's not, it's, it's not what my, my spirit tells me this is. So um, it, 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 a lot of integrity and wherewithal for a young person. Like, oh, this is who and how I am. I just, I, I, I refuse to live in shame. I just will not do that. And I will not allow anyone to have that kind of power over me. And I made that decision when I, when I moved to Cincinnati and came out of the closet. I was working at, at, working at uh, St. Joe's Villa um, over in Montford Heights with kids. But still... Yeah, I mean, and I didn't walk in and say, oh, you know, I'm Ron and I'm a homosexual, hire me. Um, but I also didn't hide it either. Um, so, but, you know, I have been of the mindset, I'm not going to hide it. I'm not ashamed of it. And if people are going to fire me or harass me in the job because of being gay, I don't want to work there anyway. And, uh, you know, I can work anywhere. I don't, you know, I, I don't have to work at this particular point or at this particular place. So it's like, so I never really allowed anyone to have that kind of, of, of pressure or any, any of that kind of power over choices that I was going to make. Now, people around me, they did, and they were nervous to be around me because, I mean, 75, 76, not that many people were out. Um, or there was always this, you know, trepidation about it. But I'm like, you know, if I can survive as... A young black man, I can certainly survive as a gay man. I mean, there's just, just there's just, you know, it's like, this is, this is easy. <laughs> so since it's the only city that I've, well, the first city that I ever experienced anything gay in, I really had nothing to compare it to. Um, and it was just a very different experience from anything that I had known because I had never gone to a gay bar. Uh, and I guess they had them in Mansfield. I just wasn't aware of them at that particular point in time. Um, and so a lot of the things that we see, we have now, they just didn't exist. The only places to go were bars. And so it, there was a lot of secretiveness and a lot of clandestine kind of stuff. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the rumor or the way that we were supposed to meet other people was either through the bars or in the parks. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, really? That's, that, that's, oh, but, you know, okay, we'll just go, go along with that. Now, you know, and I went to the parks, but I just couldn't, it's just like, that wasn't me. So I couldn't do that. So we went to bars. Um, and you know, the bars were not lit up. They didn't have signs in front. They didn't have gay flag. I mean, the gay flag didn't even exist at that time. Um, so they didn't have any, there, there was nothing that would indicate that they were gay bars. Um, you had an address. They had this little, they had a book called the Damron Guide. And it was a, it was a booklet that was, a, and it was, it was worldwide. And it had a listing of all the gay places in the world. It, bars, restaurants, what they would call the, the cruisy areas. So Mount Airy Forest, Burnett Woods, we were 19. 
actually the year before, um, as, as I think about my life, I've actually had a very career life, whether I realize it or not, or whether I acknowledge that or not. My sophomore year, um, my roommate was gay. Um, and it wasn't where he sat down and came out of the closet. He had, he had come to visit me in my hometown and he was sitting, <laughs> we went to a party with some friends and he was sitting on, on, the, on the couch holding hands uh, with one of my friends, one of my male friends. Um, and I saw that and I was like, okay. And you know, my friends were like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? He's your roommate. Oh, you know, he, he, you know he's, it's like, I'm not gonna do anything. What am I, you know, what am I supposed to do? I figured I'd let him present me with, 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 what, what, with whatever information he was going to present me with. Um, so we never talked about it. And then, oh, it was like a few months later, he was, a, he was, a, he was the uh, drum major, and so he was in Kappa Kappa Psy because he played an instrument in the band. Um, and so on Thursday nights, he would tell me that he was going to Kappa Kappa Psy meetings. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think anything about it. And one Thursday, I was sitting in my room studying, and a friend of his comes in who was also in Kappa Kappa Psy. Um, and, you know, we're sitting there talking, and it's like, why aren't you at the, at, at the Kappa Kappa Psy meeting? He's like, there, what Kappa Kappa Psi meeting? I say, well, Gino goes to Kappa Kappa Psi meetings on Thursday nights. Why are you in the room? He looked at me and he says, there's no Kappa Kappa Psi meetings on Thursday nights. I was like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> so later on that evening, my roommate comes back. And we're sitting there talking. I said, well, how was the meeting, Gino? <laughs> He said, oh, it was fine, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, Tom tells me that there weren't any, and never have been any Kappa Psi meetings on Thursdays. And he finally came out. He said, well, you know, I didn't know how to tell you. I didn't want to make you uncomfortable. And then I kind of laughed, and I said, I saw you holding hands with Ned Flynn on the couch. It's like, seriously, you didn't think anybody saw that? It's like, you know, and he's like, well, why didn't you say something? It's like, well, what was, you know, what, what, what was I going to say? And still, I had not come out to him. Um, and the funny part about it is he, myself, and Tom Guthrie, the guy I was talking about, and another friend of ours, Alfred, um, we were all three gay. Now, Tom and, and Gino knew that at the time, and probably Alfred too, but I didn't uh, know that about me. Um, and so, and we were all, Tom, myself, and Gino, we were all in hall government. And so I, you know, we switched between being president, vice president, and social chair. Because I, and I sit back and I'm like, little do those boys know, or those did those men know at, at Miami University in 1971 that a bunch of queers were leading the dormitory. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, two black men on top of that, two black queers were leading the dormitory and Miami University of Buffalo in 1971. Yeah. About, you know, it's like, okay. Um, so, you know, even years later when I talked to them, it's like, why didn't you tell me? Or, you know, tell me that you were, you know, or at least tell me where to go, you know, because, I mean, they said absolutely nothing. Um, and I can't remember what they said. Um, but um, it was, it was, you know, I, when I look back at my life, it's like I've probably had more queer experiences, and I mean, I've never, I've never led a straight life. Let me put it that way. I didn't have a girlfriend. Not I, well, well, you know how people pretend and they go out on dates and they yeah. get involved in football, and I was just like, oh no. And that's just they tried to get me to do that. And I'm like, mm -mm, I'm not doing that. Uh, I tried my hand at baseball once, but it's just it's like, nope, not doing it. I'll just be a bookworm and I'm okay with that. I don't know if it was freeing, but it was just an opportunity to explore, you know, just in a way and things that, that I only thought about at that point. Um, and, you know, the world was out of college, out of the closet, the world was my oyster. So, you know, what was I going to do with this? So, you know, I guess I expected a lot more um, openness in terms of gayness when I moved, came to Cincinnati. That really wasn't necessarily the case. Um, you know, there were gay people. Um, and people went to bars, but as far as, you know, being out in public and, and, and publicly acknowledge, acknowledging being gay and things like that, um, that didn't happen. But I'm also not certain that that was even a thing back then. 
Um, you know, Stonewall happened in New York and it takes quite a few years for things to filter from, you know, the coast to Cincinnati, you know, what does they say, 20 years? Um, but evidently at some point in time, and this was before my time, and it must have ended right before I moved here, there was the Johnson party boat. And the Johnson party, I thought it was a, you know, one of those urban myths. And, but then I found out a couple of years ago, it really did exist. Um, where, you know, they would go out on these cruises in, on the Ohio River. Now, supposedly, and rumor has it, is that, you know, the Coast Guard would raid the boat and, you know, the men would jump into the river and, and swim to the shore and things like that. And it's like, uh, it's the Ohio River. I don't know that that really happened, but um, I did. I mean, I, that was before my time. So, but as far as, it didn't, it, it was still underground still very underground, but it wasn't necessarily, part of me wants to say it wasn't seedy, but it really was seedy. Um, but, but seedy wasn't bad. Um, you know, so I, and I guess to give you an idea, at, at this bar Badlands, they would always play disco. And so, you know, people are dancing, and, but they're not touching. A couple times they decided to play slow songs people lost their minds and not in a good way. People got really, really upset and really, really angry because it changed the dynamic from being fun, being, being sexual and frivolous to being, you know, to being intimate and being close. And people just didn't know how to, how to manage that, didn't know how to deal with that. And these were the patrons. So I, it only happened a couple of times um, because it just, people pushed back on it so hard. Um, and I always thought that was odd. It's like, really? Why? Really? <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the way things were at the time. Um, now, the one thing that I will say is that the bars were actually pretty segregated at the time. Um, and when I say that, meaning it took a lot for black people to get in the bars, because there was always the questions, there was always, you got to have like five or six, I'm exaggerating, but at least three IDs. And if you didn't have the IDs, you couldn't get in. And even sometimes with the IDs, you couldn't get in unless you had a white person vouch for you, or if the uh, manager or the door person knew the black people that you were with, you were able to get in. Um, and that was the case in a lot of the bars. They really like heavily carted people to prevent them from coming in. Um, and at Badlands, they had a dance floor. And I think the thing that really struck me about that particular bar, that particular dance floor, is white people would dance at one end of the floor and black people would dance at the other end of the floor. And it was like that the entire time that it was open. And, it was, and I even mentioned that, like, oh, that's not really what's happening. It's like, how can you not see this? It's like you have all these, I mean, literally crowded on this end of the bar, the white people, and then you had the black people at this end, but the black, white people wouldn't go down there to the black end of the bar. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, <laughs> it's like 77, 78. And it's like, really, we're still doing this? Um, so it was, it was it, in, in some levels, it, it, it's still segregated in a lot of ways. Um, it, it, it's not as progressive as you would think that it would, a city this size would be in 2023. Um, you know, I, uh, people, uh, I haven't, well, since COVID, I really haven't been to bars, but, um, and I think because of the things that I've done in this city and people know who I am, I don't necessarily have problems when I go to places like that or didn't, but since all the places that I went to closed and everything is, you know, all the bars are new and I don't know the, 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 the newer bartenders and the new bar owners and stuff like that who knows what I would run into if I went in the bar. So, and, and it's not that, and that's not the reason I've avoided it. Just, you know, I'm at that point where I'm probably not going to start to get ready to go out at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Those days are, are beyond me. You know, if I'm already out, that's one thing, but it, don't call me at 10 o'clock and say, oh, we're going to go out. <laughs> it's like, that's not happening. It's like, have fun. I'll, I'll call me in the morning. We'll have breakfast. <laughs> Well, they didn't have they didn't have specialty bars back then. It was just bars. You know, Badlands was actually a country western leather bar. So in the front you had your well, you know, in the front they had the the wood and they had saddles and they had cowboy hats and they had the chaps 
and they had, you know, stuff that would, well, because at, at that time they put it all together, leather, Levi and cowboy. It was all, it was all the same category. Um, so you had, there was a, a, a leather group uh, in Cincinnati called Cincinnati Chat, not Cincinnati, no, Chaps came later, but, um, oh God, why am I blanking on this? I'm sorry. Um, uh, it'll come to me because I can see their their um, their logo and things like that. Um, oh man! But anyway, uh, that was the bar that they hung out in. So there, it was a mixture of drag queens. Drag really wasn't as drag shows weren't necessarily a thing then. Um, drag queens were, but drag shows were not. Uh, that didn't come along until like the eighties. Um, with the with the uh, creation of the court system and and actually with uh, uh, HIV when uh, the drag queens would perform at the dock um, to raise money, well, it was at the dock and it was at um, what was what was WG Magics at the time. It was called WG Magics um, to do their. Sh uh, <laughs> I almost had it. Uh, it turned to the the leather group. Um, but there weren't drag, at least not to the bars that I went to, there weren't drag shows. Badlands, um, Darwin's was across the street. They had uh, Golden Lions, which is up in Clifton. Um, that's where the college crowd and the older uh, members of the community went. And that, uh, that was like a bar that was in existence like 30 years back then. So it, it was the longest the bar that was open the longest in Cincinnati, as far as I know. Um, so I would go there and that catered more to the older crowd, uh, the, the college professors, um, those of us who liked older men, we went there. Um, so, it, uh, but then you would have your, uh, the, the show, the show tune queens, you know, they sit around the piano and play show tunes and things like that. So, you know, the, all the, all the Barbara, Barbara Streisand, I mean, I just, people would play Barbara Streisand all the time. And, and, you know, and at that point it was like Peggy Lee, you know, all, all, all the, all the, the jazz divas from the sixties, you know, they were, they would play the songs on the jukebox or at the piano and things like that. Um, there was a bar up on uh, McMillan called Just Friends. Um, and that was probably more of a, you know, for at that point in time, I was probably like 25, 26. And that was more geared towards people in that age group. Um, you know, they had an upstairs and a downstairs. Um, there were no gay restaurants. Um, they didn't have, um, well, again, they didn't have drag shows. Um, people, were, it's, people were still pretty hush-hush about it. You know, every once in a while, and particularly at Badlands, I noticed this so much at other bars, but this was still a time when um, it was not uncommon for the fire department to show up at the bar. You know, and they didn't, like, it wasn't a raid, but they would come in, and one of the things that they would tell people is you needed to make sure you have your ID on you when you come in the bar. So just in case people did get raided. Um, but the fire department would come through and they would say, you know, they're looking for code violations. Right. Um, and, it, you know, they didn't shut things down, but it was, it was just that awkwardness and that um, tenseness there. It's like, what's really going on here? You knew what was going on, but you really couldn't say anything. Um, and fast forward about, what, 2010. Uh, and I had just taken over Tri-State and we were having, and there were two incarnations of Tri-State Leather. Um, when, um, Nigel Cotterell, who ran, um, well, owned Tilly's and, and Below Zero, um, he was actually the original owner. He started Tri-State, um, and then he passed it on to me. But so the second time um, we were at um, Below Zero, the first night of Tri-State after a seven, eight year hiatus, guess what happened? The fire department came in to check 
for fire codes. And I was standing there on stage, you know, I was talking and all of a sudden they walked in. I was thinking to myself, I can't believe this is really happening. And then I stood there and I kind of chuckled. And after they left, I thought, do they really understand what they did? They just walked into a leather event with people who were into men in uniforms and paraded through this place in, 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 their, uh, in their flyer regalia. And it's like, well, thank you for that fantasy. <laughs> But I was just, it, it, I was blown away because it had been so long since I had seen it. And it's like, really, we're doing this again? Um, but um, I'm trying to think of other bars that were around. Oh, and then they had, I guess there was the Subway. Um, now, <laughs> I was never a fan of the Subway. It was always, you know, and none of these bars were, were high end. Let me put it that way. All of them were kind of sleazy. And when I say sleazy, meaning they weren't, I mean, they were, some of them were warehouses. Some of them were just, I mean, they were, they, they were not nice. By today's standards, they were not nice places. I had a friend who, and I was describing life, gay life, and I, I, that just sounds really dirty. And it's like, oh, you would have not been very happy. Um, and I, you know, and I guess that kind of gives us an idea of how things have progressed because, you know, there was that, there was not an expectation that things were going to be high end in, in, in gay places. I mean, it just, didn't didn't exist but, yeah and so now it's just you know everything has to be you know you have to dress up and it's like you know give me the counterculture stuff i mean part of me and quite honestly part of me misses that um because they're just you know that underground sleazy element to it that was just kind of just added to the the, the mystique and, and and you know and the lustiness of it um that isn't there anymore um you know, and I think that sometimes people have, you know, we've, we've kind of uh, uh, sanitized our sexuality to kind of fit the norm so that, you know, we don't get harassed, um, which is really kind of unfortunate. And I, and I was telling uh, someone uh, this past Friday, um, kind of doing a similar interview, and I said, it's really interesting that, you know, they consider my generation and things that went on before, before marriage equality, you know, we kept the movement from going forward. And it's like, oh no, we didn't keep the movement from going forward. We were ourselves and that's what made the movement move forward. Um, we didn't hide, we didn't sanitize it. We, you know, we're not trying to be anybody but who we are. Um, and so, you know, it, it's almost like anything that's not, oh, what do you want to call it? Um, that's not necessarily vanilla, but you know, well, I need to take you on a date. I need to, you know, the, you know, those, those, those socially acceptable processes. Um, outside of that, people just don't want, don't seem to want to have anything to do. It's like, you know, sometimes I don't want to get married. I don't necessarily want to go on a date. It's like, let's just hook up and, you know, get to know each other and do what we're going to do. Um, and I think there's room in the community for all of that you know it's not a monolith and i think sometimes it's 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 frightening that it, it feels like people believe we need to be a monolith so that we're accepted it's like i don't want to say fuck acceptance but pretty much fuck acceptance <laughs> <laughs> well you know you had your bar crowd and then there are people who never went to bars you know i you know people who you know i happened to, to meet either through work or you know other friends who went to bars, but people they never went to bars. You had your you know, MCC crowd at that particular point in time, um, and you know I went to MCC a couple times. Um, Just for the camera, will you explain MCC? Uh, Metropolitan Community Church, um, which is up on Hollister. Um, and that's where you know people talk about you know gay marriage in 2015. I saw my first gay marriage in 1979 at the Church of Our Savior, two women got married in the church. Um, and so they had that and they had dignity and integrity who were, they were the, those were two, one was Catholic and the other one I think was Lutheran uh, for, for gay religious people. Um, you know, so they did their church thing. You know, they had their little housewarmings and their sweater parties and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had your, your A gays um, and a gays are gay men who have lots of money, more money than they, well, this is the stereotype. 
more money than what they know to do with. So they kind of like, um, you know, spend it unwisely sometimes. <laughs> um, so you had that crowd. Here, the men's and women's community never really mix that much, and they still don't. After all these years, they still do not. Um, you know, the men and women had their own separate bars. Um, and in fact, the first bar that I went to was Adam's Rib, which was up on um, Jefferson. Um, and that was a women's bar. Um, and it was uncomfortable because they did not want men in the bar. And, I, you know, it, you know when you're not welcome, so I really didn't want to be there, but the friend who took me, in fact, one of the, one of the guys that uh, lived in the corridor that I was telling you about, he was, he was one of the ones that took me to my first gay bar. Um, he finally came out of the closet. Um, I mean, we talked about it, and I told him I was, and he told me he was, so he took me to my first gay bar because he knew where it was. Uh, but, um, Adam's Rib was the first gay bar I ever went to was a lesbian bar. Uh, but still, never did mix all that much. Excuse me, still don't mix all that much. Um, you never really had a large mixture of races in bars. You'd have a, you know, a handful of black people um, in like what I would call the main bars, the bars that people went to, uh, Badlands, Just Friends, Darwin's, and stuff like that. Um, now, there were black bars. Um, Central Cafe was a Central Cafe was a neighborhood bar that catered to everybody. It wasn't necessarily a gay bar per se, but gay black gay men and women frequented it, uh, and probably trans people. I guess there, there was a place called Arts over in the West End, and a couple of West End places. I did not go to those, um, and I, I'm I was I'm. I never went to Central Cafe. <laughs> this place always scared me. Well, because I heard about fights and people had knives and guns and stuff like that. And I'm like, we're not doing that. So I, I just never went there. Um, now, later on, it became Carl's place. Um, and I guess the clientele improved somewhat. Um, but I, I still never went there. Um, and I knew Carl, actually, he was, uh, we were both, we worked in, the, we both worked in the field of chemical dependency. Um, and so when he, re well, I think he, re he had retired um, when he uh, took that over. Um, but um, yeah, it, all that was just, it was just a real interesting time to, to, to be alive and, and be queer in Cincinnati. Uh, but yeah, the communities had never really, and you know, and, and then the, like I said, the, the Badlands was a mixture of leather and Levi and, and, you know, drag and, and trans and cross dressers. But again, you didn't have all those terms then. I mean, it, even the, it was, you know, basically we, they were, we call them cross dressers. Trans was not even, it wasn't a word that I was familiar with. Let me put it that way. I'm sure it was there and there were trans, trans people around, but it wasn't something that I knew a whole lot about and it wasn't something that I was exposed to. You know, I saw uh, men in dresses. Uh, you know, I'm sure that people talked about Peaches Laverne and, you know, she, she was a big uh, uh, fixture at Badlands with her, you know, her, what do you call those drinks? I forgot those uh, glasses that have the, bowls and the stems and you know she'd walk around with those all the time and um you know hold court and you know and you'd have the and, and lesbians would be in there but it, basically it was men yeah well you know men were on the dance floor women and men could mix in the middle bar and in the front bar it was men um then they had a bar that opened up well the dock opened up in around 1980 um and before that, there was Spurs, which was on A Street, which was a leather bar. And I think as, as things went, got into the 70s and 80s, people started to, I guess, you know, specialize a little bit more because it, when they opened Spurs, it was opened as a leather bar um, because Dale Dissinger and Rob Corman um, were the owners of that. And Rob was also at Miami at the same time as I was, so I knew him. And in fact, the guy that uh, took me to the, bar, to the bar for the first time they went to high school together. So all these little ties together and, and you know, people think of Cincinnati as being a, a large city. It's like, oh, it really isn't. It is so small. It is such a small town. 
um, because everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows your name is kind of like Cheers. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then Dale and Rob opened the dock. And when the dock opened up, it, it was a leather bar. It was a leather disco. Um, Dale was not particularly fond of women. And so, you know, and at that point, people were pushing to do more things as a community. So men and women needed to do things together. And so he didn't like that. He didn't want women in a gay bar. And so he came up with this dress code. And the dress code was that women had to wear dresses. Well, in 1980, who wore dresses? I mean, that was just like, that was so 1960s, you know, women stopped wearing Even straight women. Right? Yeah, yeah. It was like, <laughs> so if, if women came in there in pants, they weren't allowed in. I mean, it, it created a controversy, to say the least. Um, but, you know, he, I th and I think for them to be able to move beyond that, he had to change the, the um, idea of what the bar was to just, a regular bar as opposed to a leather bar. I mean, Spurs was still open. And at that point, um, him and um, Rob had broken up. So he took Spurs and then Rob took the dock. And I think Rob was the one that changed the policies there. Uh, but then the dock became the place where we had fundraisers for HIV and, and those types of things. And you know, I saw Sylvester at the dock, um, which, you know, that, that'll be one of my, my, my lifelong memories. Cause I, I still love Sylvester. Um, but to actually see him in person, you know, and I think he died like maybe a year later. So, you know, I, we, 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 we got to see him towards the end. Um, I'm trying to think of other bars. Um, and, they, and these are all on this side of the river. I think at some point in time, there was, Dale had a place over in Covington, and I can't remember the name of it, but there was a lesbian bar restaurant over in Covington um, that I went to a couple times, a, a, a friend of mine, um, his, I think his sister was one of the owners of it and her partner, their name or the bar's name? Bar. No, no. Um, well, I, I don't know if you, there, there's an attorney and I you know she's out of Margo, Margo Grubbs. She was one of the, um, she was one of the owners. So she would be able to tell you what the name was. And if she can't, well, if she wasn't one, I'm, 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 if I'm remembering right, she was one of the owners because I think she was partners with my friend's sister. Um, but if she doesn't, if that wasn't the case, she would at least remember what the bar is, what the name was. Um, it was a nice place. But again, you know, whenever men entered, at least for me, whenever I entered those spaces or men that I was with, it was just always uncomfortable because we'd always just get stared at like, we don't want you here. You don't belong here. Um, and, and, and I got it. I mean, it wasn't like it was a, I wasn't insulted. Um, I was like, well, your food is good. I want to be able to sit here and let me finish my dinner before you're chasing me out. <laughs> and they weren't that bad. Um, and I think there were a couple women's bars up in Clifton on Short Vine. Um, there was a, uh, and then you had, then there were some gay restaurants. Um, you know, there was a bar on Broadway called On Broadway, but before that bar was on Broadway, it was called On Broad. It was it was Gordon's on Broadway, and it was a restaurant. Um, little, I don't know if you ever were you ever in On Broadway when it was open. You know, I remember. I don't know that I ever was, but I remember the. I remember where it was. Okay. Think, it wasn't a big. When was it open? It closed in, in 2016. Okay. I, I remember seeing it, but I don't remember thinking about it. Um, and that was actually, because okay, whenever I walked in there, when it was a bar, I, I would look around, I was like, how was this ever a restaurant? <laughs> and where was the kitchen? I mean, it was just, it was, it was so small, but on Fridays and Saturdays, and it had a piano. And so, I mean, it was, it was actually a, a thriving business. And in, in the, it was like, in, it had to be in the eighties um, to have a gay bar. And then we had Rosconi's over on 6th Street. Um, that was a gay restaurant. Um, and then a few years later, there was Gordon's up on Ludlow, which was a gay restaurant. And then they had Peterson's Cat, Peterson's restaurants, and there were three of them. The Peterson family owned them, and one of the Peterson brothers was gay. And so each brother got a restaurant, and so they tried to, when I say they meaning we, uh, tried to 
give that as the um, 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 gay restaurant, but it, it, it never really caught on. Um, and then at the, then the um, places that where a lot of us spend a lot of time was Burnett Woods. And, you know, and I say that people are, oh, you're up there cruising around. It's like, well, and that, and that did happen. But on Sunday afternoons and Saturday afternoons, people would actually meet in the park and they would have blankets. They would bring their music. They would play, they would bring cards and they'd sit and they'd play cards, um, take a nap, you know, sun, uh, play volleyball. I mean, it, it was like this little community uh, that, that would take place up there on set Friday and Saturday nights, now, or Friday and Saturday afternoons. Now, and people still cruise, so it wasn't like it was, because you know, that went on. You know, people were still driving around in their cars, and we all knew what was going on, and we'd sit and watch them drive around and say, okay, he's coming back around. It's like, is he going to get some? And it's like we were figuring out, you know, who they were following, who they were chasing, and things like that. You know, and I, and I met a lot of men in that park, so didn't fool around in the park. Um, but I met a lot of men there, but it, 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 it was like a, a social hangout for us. And then um, when they started, well, I don't know if, it, I guess tea dances were always a thing, but then they started having tea dances on Sunday afternoons and they would take place at the Golden Lions. Not the tea dances that you go to now. I mean, they're just not. Um, and I was telling somebody the other day, it's like, I think I would love to, to have the old tea dances back. Um, well, you know, it's basically just a bunch of men who had taken off their shirts and they were sweaty and they were just rubbing them and, 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 and just rubbing all over each other um, and dancing, which was a lot of fun. I mean, it, it was very sexual. Um, and, you know, and I think, and, and well, again, these were, this was a time when men and women didn't mix. So it, it, just, it was just a very different energy. Um, so, um, there, there was that, but um, I'm trying to think of other places that we were. Um, yeah, any other more like informal gathering spaces? <laughs> yes, there was. The Greyhound bus station <laughs> used to be where, I guess, it, well, at some point it was a central trust tower. I don't know what it is now, um, but it's at Maine. There was... Fifth, Main, Sixth, and Sycamore, that, that block. That's where the bus station sat. So when the bars would close or when people got bored, um, people would get in their cars and drive down to that area and just drive around the block, you know, trying to, to, to connect and, and meet people. And, you know, use a lot of gas. And, 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 you know, the police were always aware of what you were doing. So... Um, we would get out of the cars and sit at, there was a retaining wall, you know, we just sit at the wall and talk and things like that, or just sit in the car and talk, you know, and I probably met more people doing that than I ever did in, a, in, in the bar. Um, and I, and at the time, and probably still the case, a lot of the restaurants and, and clubs employed a lot of gay people. So we met people through going out to eat, you know, our servers, our bartenders, uh, musicians, and things like that. You know, they, they, people were a lot more, they were, and it's interesting because it seems like the more uh, we become accepted, the less out we are with each other. Because um, yeah, I remember meeting my roommate at, at uh, this restaurant called um, Underground New Orleans, um, which was down on, I want to say Main Street. Um, and I'd gone in there with a friend of mine and we were celebrating our birthdays and I, you know, we had presents and, you know, cards and all that kind of stuff, you know, gay men. Um, and we're sitting there being innocuous thinking we're, we're, we're not being obvious. <laughs> just two friends just hanging out in, in a, in a, in a restaurant and celebrating their birthdays. Um, and he waited on us. He, you know, we settled off the bill. He comes back to the table, you know, brings us back our, our change. I don't think credit cards were really a thing back then. Um, and he says, I'll see you at the bars. And he walked away. And I was sitting, I looked at my friend. And he looked at me, it's like, how did he know? How did he know? Like, oh my God. And he was like, what are you doing? He's giving us away. 
So we went over to the bar, Badlands actually, and there he was. And I walked up to him and I said, how did you know? And he looked at me and he says, who else but two gay men would come into a restaurant <laughs> and exchange birthday presents? I was like, oh, okay, all right. But you know, and the funny part about that was he wasn't from Cincinnati, he was from DC. So he had a whole different um, energy to be able to tune into that kind of stuff. You know, here we are in the Midwest, you know, being low key, you know, and, and, and not necessarily closeted, but just kind of, you know, a lot of the people were flying under the radar. Whereas, you know, he was not, that was not his energy, but at the same time, he was also not in the closet. I mean, he never marched in a pride parade. He never, you know, did any protesting or anything like that. Whereas, you know, I was like, you know, Che Guevara, yeah. <laughs> Around any of this? Anything, any coded language to try to flag down other queer people? Well, Friends of Dorothy was one. Um, PLUs, people like us. Um, how, how are these used? Like, what, what kind of Well, when we were talking about being out um, or talking about or seeing somebody walking down the street, like, say, for instance, if you're in a restaurant or you're at work. And you see somebody, it's like, I wonder if they're a PLU. Um, I wonder if they're a friend of Dorothy's. And that friend of Dorothy's really wasn't used that much. It was more PLU. Because uh, anybody that had any brain cells would be able to figure out what friends of Dorothy meant. Um, so it's more like PLU. Um, people would switch pronouns all the time. Um, when they were talking about men, they would say she, her, um, my girlfriend. But they were really talking about their boyfriend. Um, and there was much more of a playfulness in terms of, we all had girl names. Everybody, all of my friends had girl names. Um, you know, they had, cause we had Frida and, <laughs> and we had Greta or is it Greta? Yeah. Um, you know, they called me Missy. Um, and I'm trying to think, um. Well, we all had girl names. So we got one of my friends we called him B. Um, we had another one named Penny. Uh, so, so, you know, it was just, it, it, and, and nobody saw anything about it. There was no um, upsetness about using a, a pronoun that didn't match your gender. It's like it, nobody really got insulted by that. Um, it, and it was kind of fun and kind of play. And to this day, and this has been 50 years, I still have friends who will call me Missy. It's like, okay, Missy. Okay, yeah, well, I don't necessarily like that name. So, <laughs> and I, I went to Pride in 1978. Was it 78 or 79? Um, and what drew me to Pride, Harvey Milk was a big thing back then. Um, you know, and so I saw him on television and, you know, I heard him talk, you know, you know, come out, come out, be who you are. You know, that's the only way that things are going to change. And that really spoke to my spirit. So I, you know, that was a, a, a driving force, but I didn't know where the pride things were. And I it didn't, it just, you know, the internet didn't exist. And so it was, it was word of mouth and I didn't run with that particular crowd. Um, and I think the first time that I heard about Pride might have been right after Harvey Milk was assassinated. And I was livid. I mean, I just, I, I, I was mad, I was hurt. And I remember just, I wept because it was just like, oh my God. And I think part of what had gone on was that, you know, he was assassinated, Martin, or John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Megger Evers was assassinated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, and then by the time that that happened with Harvey Milk, it's like I had had enough. You know, and, and part of me, I mean, I'm going to say I knew Martin Luther King. The church that I grew up, went to when I was growing up, the minister of that church was Martin Luther King's uncle. So he would actually come to Mansfield. So I actually, you know, shared a space with him that was not 
it was a public space, but it wasn't like he was on a podium talking about civil rights. I mean, he was he was being a minister. You know, it was like the prodigal son came home. So there was some kind of of attachment and some emotional connection to him. So when he when he was assassinated, it was just it broke my heart in a lot of different for a lot of different reasons. So you know, John F. Kennedy was the same way. Um, you know, he had actually come to my hometown um, on his campaign, and, and my grandmother and my mother took me, I went with, she took me as I was, what, eight, so I didn't know anything about politics. Um, but I went with them up to the square to, to listen to him talk. And, you know, and obviously he was important to them. Um, and so, you know, all those assassinations had taken place and, you know, we're feeling good about this. And then, you know, he gets shot and it's just like, oh my God. And so I went, that was, I think that was the first pride march that I went to. And it wasn't even a pride march, it was a pride protest. It, they weren't the celebrations that we see now. Um, and even at that point in time, it was more of a, I mean, they didn't have speakers. Well, not that I remember. It was just people were marching down the street in protest. It was uncomfortable. It was ugly. You know, people would swear at us. And, and the police were not friendly. Um, you know, they would, I'm trying to remember, because we had to either, sometimes we had to be on the sidewalk as opposed to on the streets. You know, they didn't block traffic off. You know, people would drive right by us and blow horns and yell at us and stuff like that. Um, and I'm trying to remember when they actually started having, you know, political speakers at, 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 at rallies. Um, and, and I don't recall when that was. Um, you know, and I, and I helped out with Pride. I was part of that, the, Greater Cincinnati Gay and Lesbian Coalition. Oh my God. <laughs> what year was that? Oh, that would have been, let's see, probably late 70s. Um, like 78, 79. Um, they also had a group here called the Gay and Lesbian, Gay and Lesbian Mental Health Professionals. Um, and I was the president of that. Um, and so I, we were part of the coalition. Um, so I would go to those meetings and it's, oh my God, it was, they, <laughs> they would just go on and on and on and on and on. Um, just, I, I get anxious thinking about that. Um, but, you know, over the years, Pride has, has um, progressed. And, and then, the, you know, Pride, and they had uh, Pride Night at Kings Island, and that was before this incarnation we have now, there was, it was Red Shirt Day at Kings Island. I, because I have a t-shirt. <laughs> All right, I'm going to find this because it's the last thing I do. It's like, I need to tell you the name of this. Oh, Sin, <laughs> Sin City. Oh, Sin City? Sin City, Cincinnati, yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's the logo. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, that was a leather group. But anyway, um, and he had sent me, he contacted me and asked me for my address. And I and he told him, I gave it to him, and I got this in the mail. And uh, his name is Gay, Gaylord Gaines, actually. Um, and he would check on me. And when I took over Tri-State, I made it a point of acknowledging the people whose shoulders we were standing on, you know, because it was really kind of making me a little nuts that people were patting themselves on the back for being, you know, such great queers. And I'm like, you do understand that this bus has been moving for a long time. This did not start with you. Uh, it's just like, seriously? <laughs> I mean, it, it was really kind of insulting. Um, so I made it a point of, of uh, I created this award called the Forebearers Award. And so giving people their flowers basically is what that was about. And so I tracked him down and, and another member of that group down and, you know, invited them to Tri-State and, and gave them their award, gave the group the award. Um, and, you know, we kind of kept in contact and, you know, and I, and I explained to him why I did it and, and who I was to him because I'm like, he may not even remember me because he, he moved away from Cincinnati and I had not seen him. In, it, it had been like 20 years. Um, but he did remember me. Um, and so we kind of kept in contact with one another over the years. And then, I, you know, he contacted me about 
my address and he sent me this. And then two days after I got this, the next day I read on Facebook where he had died. And he had sent me, and he sent me a little note, you know, in terms of there was, it was very personal and a little card and a little note and things like that. He knew he was dying. And he sent this to me, so it's like, oh my God. And so I put it on that day, and I, it, other than taking a shower, I've never taken it off. I mean, that was just kind of like one of those that, that it, my queer life has been a spiritual journey as opposed to a physical journey, if that makes any sense. Um, it's it, it's, it's the, the level of connectedness that I have felt to the universe from coming out of the closet. I mean, think about how my life has played out. I mean, where else would you have a bunch of, of gay boys trying to figure out who they are and it's happening right in front of you? It's like, this was a gift to me. I mean, this, 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 it was an opportunity and it was, and it was happening right in front of my face. So that's, that's why I look at these things. And so, you know, when he did those things, I mean, it really touched me. And then when I had the opportunity to, to give him his flowers, I took it. And then, you know, here, here I am when he died, what, three or four years ago. And I'm sitting there and I'm and able to carry a flower given to me by a man who had given me flowers when I was in my 20s. And I'm almost 70 years old now. So, you know, that, it, it, that to me is just like, if I was not out of the closet, if I was not a gay man, this would not be my experience. And people will ask if, you know, if you had it to do all over again, would you do it? And I, it, it, I cringe when people were like, well, why would I do that? All the hassle and blah, blah, blah that comes along with this. Oh, sign me up. I would do it again and again and again and again. I mean, I just, I just, I, is life perfect? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but at the same time, um, in terms of a fulfilling, you know, soul enriching experience, coming out of the closet has been that and more. And I would, and I would not trade it for the world. No, I mean, because it, 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 it wouldn't have made sense. I mean, and, and I wouldn't sure. have had the experiences that I had now, you know, and, and, and the, you know, people who do and who, you know, reject it for many years. Oh yeah. And it's like, why would you do that? I mean, I never pretended to be anything other than this. You know, even when they clocked me in high school, it's kind of like, okay. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't like necessarily say, well, you're right. <laughs> but at the same time, I didn't get upset. I didn't get, I mean, and it, so it wasn't, yeah, I just, I, yeah. And I've been lucky from that standpoint. I get, I, I, I get that because I don't, you know, people have their own things that they have to deal with, you know, people and personalities and parents and friends and, you know, religious beliefs and things like that. But I think coming from the family that I come from, I mean, it's like, who are they going to cast? How are they going to cast stones on people? Yeah, especially as, you know, activists. And, you know, well, that and plus, you know, yeah. some of the seedy things they've done too. And it's yeah. like, yeah, who are you going to, how are you going to judge me for something that, you know, you've done a whole lot worse than I'm doing. Um, but pride has been, uh, um, pride is interesting. You know, I, I want to say it was like 78 or 79, whatever. I think it was the year. It stopped and came back, right? It, well, this was in the 70s because it, it, Harvey Milk getting assassinated is what drove that. But he was assassinated in November, I think. So I, it had to be the, the year after he, he was assassinated. And maybe it was even the, um, after they charged or they didn't charge him with first degree murder. Um, the white, you know, the white night riots and all that stuff, I think. And then with Anita Bryant, I mean, all that stuff was happening. So that, I think that was what drove that, drove me to go down and protest um, and get involved with the marches. There was one pride um, that, and they always, well, the other thing about Burnett Woods was that whenever there was an issue in the community, whenever we would rally to talk about how we were going to approach it, we always met at Burnett Woods at the gazebo. The gazebo was like the meeting spot. Um, and in fact, when I, I did an interview for the uh, Buckeye Flame last Friday, um, and a young activist had come down to talk about, to interview me for this article and things like that, and I said, you have got to experience the gazebo. 
<laughs> and burn at woods. So I actually made them go up. That's like, I, I want you to go, just sit there and just you know, soak up this energy because this really was the focal point for the gay community for lots and lots of years here. I mean, a lot of the things that, 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 that you see in terms of some of the organizations and, and, and a lot of that stuff, I mean, they started right here. So, you know, this is like that, that nexus of, of creativity for, for, for the community. Um, is, is that that one that sits on Clifton Avenue or the one over by the pond? The one that sits on Clifton Avenue. Clifton Avenue. Yep. Yeah. Um, because when Pride came back, that's, we would start there and then the parade would go from Burnett Woods down to Hofner Park in Northside. Um, and then when we outgrew Hofner Park, that's when they went to um, Fountain Square um, or returned to Fountain Square because we had pride on Fountain Square a couple times, uh, several times over the years. Um, it, it took a long time before the city actually, you know, had a, had a, you know, a gay day proclamation. Um, you know, and I think Bobby Stern did one. Um, David Mann, I think, did a Gay Tolerance Day. Um, Charlie Lucan wouldn't have anything to do with it. I think um, Jerry Springer had a gay, a gay Day or Gay Tolerance Day. I mean, so it was kind of hit or miss. Um, and I think the other thing that I think is really important to talk about, and I want to talk about, um, I don't want to say race, well, it is racism in, in the gay community because it's there and it always has been. Um, and I remember uh, when Marion Spencer was running for city council. And I guess and the political organization at that time was Stonewall, Stonewall Cincinnati. And so they wanted to have, I guess they were trying to get her endorsement or wanted to endorse her or trying to, to get, get in on her good side because I guess they saw her as a way to get their foot in the door for equality, which, you know, was... In terms of strategy, there really wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but they decided to meet with the black men in the community. And I was in graduate school, so it was myself. And there were about four or five other black men. Um, and, and I'm specifically saying black men because, again, they didn't invite women to the table. It was men. Um, and the representative of Stonewall, my uh, I was a graduate assistant, and the person that I worked for, he was, a, he was an uh, African-American gay man. He, he was the one that helped coordinate this. So we're sitting and talking, and, you know, the, the, the people from Stonewall were asking us, you know, what our concerns were and, you know, how we done this and how we done that and, and you know, all that. And, and we were there for, like, a couple hours. And after it all ended, I said, I have a question. And they were like, well, what is that? And I was like, well, I find it interesting that, in all this time that I've lived in Cincinnati, you have never asked black people what they thought about things, you know, how we felt about things. You know, you were not interested in all, at all, what we had to say. So why is it now when you're trying to get the approval of Mary and Spencer that you sit us down and want to have this conversation? And what's going to happen after this conversation is over? And what's going to happen if she doesn't endorse us? I mean, I, it's like, it, it, and they got upset with me, and I'm like, I think it's a legitimate question. Um, and I think that it's something that doesn't get addressed. I was, was thinking about it from a standpoint. It's really hard sometimes to be in a community where you're fighting for civil rights, but you're also being discriminated against from people who are supposed to be fighting for your civil rights. And how can you brag about taking strategies from the civil rights playbook to further the agenda of the gay community, but you still discriminate against people of color in the community. That's a disconnect, and I will call you on it every time. Um, in some ways, I'm not popular with, with, with <laughs> the community because I do call them on that stuff. It's like, you got to do it, and they get upset, but I'm like, you know, here we are in 2023 and we're still having the, I, I was at a, at, a, at a meeting and I was a, at a, on a board and I was their DEI designee, which, you know, that's a whole nother topic of conversation, but um, they pulled some stuff that wasn't DEI friendly and I challenged him on it. 
And one of the board members said to me, it's like, well, you know, so what you're telling me is, is somebody like me who has done all these things for this organization, um, you know, spent money, time, la, 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 la. I don't qualify to be a board member, even though he's sitting on the board. So I wouldn't qualify to be a board member, but you would go out on the street and find some random black person and bring them on the board and they don't have any qualifications and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just sitting there and I was like, number one, that's not what I said. And number two, and I said, I'm really struggling with this. I said, I've been doing this kind of work since I was 14 years old, you know, in terms of, of, of you know, race relations and things like that. And what you just said to me in 2021 are verbatim stuff that came out of people's mouths in 1969. That's terrifying to me. And it's even more terrifying is that you who call yourself a progressive liberal person, you believe that you actually said something legitimate. That's frightening. And I resign. It's like, you know what? Been there, done there, done this. I am not doing this again. I, you know, I'm 70 years old, going to be 70 years old. It's like, I just want peace. You know, I want to be able to, you know, I, I've done the fighting. <laughs> I've done the arguing. I've, I've done the protesting. And I just don't, it's not that I don't have it in me anymore because I think it needs to, it still needs to happen. But as I tell my friends, it's like, we've all seen that movie where, you know, there's a, like Star Wars, like, you know, there's a battle. The old guy gets on the horse and goes riding in the battle. He doesn't come out or come back. And it's like, that's not how I'm going out. <laughs> so, so, you know, you all go protest, you do your thing. I will support you and I will do what I can from here. But it's like, you know, I will be that person, you know, I'll have the fire going, I'll have food on the stove. If you need a respite, you need a place to sit down and decompress. You need a place to sit down and strategize. You need a place to sit down and just, and be quiet or silent. I'm more than happy to provide that. But, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm done fighting. I can't. I just, you know, I just want to be able to live my life. And, you know, because, you know, pride is one of those things where I think that we can have gay pride in terms of protest. But as I was telling a friend of mine, you know, the parades and all that kind of stuff, they're, they're, they're symbolic of pride. But what you do in your everyday life is really what pride is all about, how you live your life. And you don't need a parade for that. And, you know, the, 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 the best way for anybody to be an activist is to live and lead an honest, authentic life. That is the largest form of protest that you can ever do because you're, you're doing your thing and you're not, le not letting anybody tell you who you should be or how you should behave. So if you can do that, you're an activist. Um, I help form, help with some of the pride uh, set up in terms of the programming. Um, with uh, gay and lesbian mental health professionals, they used to have Pride Week. And so we would do coffee houses, uh, you know, something that would offer an alternative to bars because, you know, I was working in chemical dependency at the time. And I, there, you know, the rates of chemical dependency in the community, you know, they're still there. But back then, I think people were just guessing in terms of what they were. Um, people weren't coming into treatment. Um, so we decided to offer an alternative um, to that. Um, so the, that type of programming, um, planning speakers, um, those types of things. There was one year, um, oh God, Barney Frank and Jerry Studs, they were two Congress, uh, members of Congress. Um, there was a scandal because they were, they were the Bill Clintons of their time, but they were having interactions with their male congressional 17 16 year old congressional pages and they got caught and it was in the paper so our pride committee decided it was a great idea to invite jerry studs to come to cincinnati to be a speaker because he was a hero because he came out of the closet and i was sitting there and I looked at my roommate at the time and i'm like um I have a question. <laughs> he didn't come out of the closet. He was forced out of the closet. And what he was doing is criminal. He was breaking the law. But you want to bring him to Cincinnati and call him a hero, and he is not a hero. I just, <laughs> it's like that didn't make any sense to me. And we really fought about that. 
um, and they wouldn't let up. Um, and so we had to, we comp well, the compromise, we ended up having two speakers that year because Jerry Studs came and I met him. I picked him up at the airport. Nice guy, you know, very, you know, very, you know, <sighs> No, looking back on it, just where things were and just, you know, they didn't have out members of Congress at the time. So there's, there's a reason he did what he was doing. Um, but we also had a guy, he was, and he, I just read, I had read the book and don't ask me the name of the book. His name was, it was about him being an out school teacher and the process of coming out in, and it was, it was in New England. Um, and his name was Eric Rafas. And so I had Eric come and speak too, just because it's like needed to have that, to me, to have that balance. Um, you know, cause you know, here's a man who's working in public education, could get fired from his job for being a teacher and he's out of the closet. Whereas this man, you know, he was hiding himself and he got caught by, you know, doing, you know, under the table kind of stuff. So um, it, people needed to, for, I needed to see that number one. And I think other people needed to see that. Um, and so, you know, did that, um, was the parade marshal in 2014. Um, and, and even that was interesting because I was chosen to do that, which, which, which was an honor. And the person who was coordinated at the time, he called me and said, you know, this is how we're going to do this. Like, you know, you're, and there was, there, I was co-marshal. Um, Crystal's going to be leading the parade. You know, she's been out for active in the community for 10 years and she's done, and she's 30 years old and she's done, and this is a white woman and she's done this, 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 and this. And I'm sitting there like, oh, okay. And the more I thought about it and I'm like, mm, I'm not liking how this is playing itself out. So I called him up and I said, we have to have a conversation terrified because I did not know how he was going to respond to this. And I said, you know, I've been out longer than she's been alive. I have been involved in the community longer than she has, but somehow I'm still riding in the back of the bus and I'm just not very comfortable with that. And so he changed it. <laughs> He said, okay, well, you're going to come first. And then Crystal and me, and he told her what was going to happen, and she understood it. Um, now, the rest of the Pride Committee weren't very happy about it because I remember being in the car and, you know, lining up for the parade. And I'm like, don't you let them get in front of you. <laughs> don't you let that car get in front of you. <laughs> well, because that was just important to me because it's like, you know, because I think in the in the city, it would you would be hard-pressed to know that there are people of color in the community that do anything because you don't see us. You know, you have, your, and, and the people that you do see, I'm, I'm friends with them, I know them, I like them, they've done a lot, and I'm not trying to take anything away from them. But there are other people in the community who don't look like them who are doing stuff. Um, and we need to be acknowledged. You know, and, it, and you know, and, and you know, with, with Cincinnati Black Pride and those types of things, I mean, I, and I'm glad that they're doing that, but there are people who are, aren't, aren't even in Cincinnati Black Pride um, who are still doing things that you need to acknowledge. You know, and I don't doubt for a minute that part of folks' enamorment with Cincinnati Black Pride is it makes them look good in terms of, you know, equity, you know, DEI and all that kind of stuff. Oh, look, we're supporting this black organization. You know, aren't, aren't we progressive people? So it, 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 some of it's performative. Some of it is genuine, but, you know, some of it's performative. I mean, a good bulk of it is performative. Um, so it's important that we need, we have these dialogues, uh, but it's also important that people start to understand that they actually have the power to make these things different than that. I shouldn't have to sit down and have this conversation with people to get you to do that stuff. If you tell me that you're an ally, that you should be able to figure this stuff out without me having to tell you that because you, you would be thinking about this differently. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be your, um, um, Oh, what are you going to call it? I don't, it's not necessarily a token, but you know, I, yeah, I don't want to be your, your, your get out of racism card 
you know, so if people are accusing you of being racist, oh, I did this for him. So, you know, I'm not really racist. It's like you did one thing that does not, you know, let you off the hook. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, I think as a community, that's something that we need to address um, and, and start to include and, and make it more friendly for people of color and make it more friendly for trans people, um, you know, non-binary people, um, people who are, I'm not sure what the term is, but in terms of people who don't have the same physical capabilities or, you know, the ableism in the community, you know, how do we address that? Um, I was in, um, uh, you know, one of the, I guess it's the Blue Jay restaurant. This is not a gay place, but a lot of gay people go there. Um, but I was thinking about this, I have a 92 uh, year old aunt that has a walker and I thought, you know, it would be great to be able to take her there, but it's really not accessible, you know, and even with a walker, it's not accessible. Um, so it, 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 you know, and how do we go about the business of addressing that in bars and in events and those types of things? Um, and, uh, you know, luckily there are people in the community who are, who are beginning to address that, but it's interesting to see how quickly and how hard people are pushing back on that and pushing back on this particular individual in terms of, of, of them wanting to, to, to have equal access for everybody in the community. Um, but, you know, and so, you know, we did pride, we did that at Fountain Square, um, uh, I, I think the last time I actually, well, that's not true. The non-celebratory pride, I guess you want to call it that, I think it was like 93, something like that. Um, How long have you been participating in pride cumulatively? Oh, well, since 78, so. So you, like, march on pride every year, or? Most years, I can't say it was every year, but most years um, I was there. Um, and, you know, some of the, the impromptu pride parades, you know, when, when, you know, the protests and things like that. I sat in a lot of the, excuse me, a lot of the gatherings up on, um, up in Burnett Woods as a gazebo. Um, now, I was never, uh, there were like two or three years where I was part of the planning committee, but for the most part, you know, that was really other, other people. Um, well, and again, I think some of it was, you know, not, not feeling welcome to be a part of that, if that makes any sense. Um, because they had, you know, they had their clique. You know, we're the ones that are doing this. You know, we're the politicians. So we're doing this. You know, we're the protesters. We're organizing this. We're planning this. Now, you know, you kind of, not you, but I think the community leaves out, you know, there's a whole another, you know, social element that's going on in the community because, you know, the sports league started, the bowling league started, you know, all those things were going on at the same time, but people don't talk about those. And those are just as, as, as important um, as, you know, the, the, the protests for, you know, of ACT UP and those types of things. Um, you know, people don't really understand, like when we, when we started the, the bowling league, and that, that started in my living room with my roommate. Um, the only place that would welcome us into their a bowling establishment was a black bowling alley in Walnut Hills called Murgards. When I tell people that, they're like, you're kidding. It's like, no, not at all. They were the only place that, that would welcome us. And then a lot of people wouldn't bowl because of, because it was in Walnut Hills. It was, uh, well, I think now it's, is it, what's that? Well, it was a mental health, well, it was a bowling alley, and then it was a mental health place. And now it's some part of the, the Catholic girls school over there. But it's one of those buildings there on, on the left-hand side of McMillan as you're going before you get to Woodburn. That's where it was. Um, same way with the softball league. When the softball league started, we played on the fields down here, the West End behind City Hall, uh, black neighborhood. You know, and some people didn't want to go down there because it was a black neighborhood. Um, and so, I mean, it just, you know, those types of things were going on at the same time. So I was probably more involved in those than I was in the, you know, I'm a bowler. <laughs> I played softball, I mean, because I grew up with that stuff. Um, so, um, you know, that stuff was going on too, but we tended to get ostracized because they didn't think that that was as important as, you know, getting laws changed. We were changing people's minds and we were changing people's attitudes. 
And, you know, and laws, I mean, how many times have we changed laws over the years? I mean, it, it's illegal to do a lot of things, but those laws changing did not and do not change people's attitudes. It doesn't even change gay people's attitudes. You, the numbers of people, gay people, who still don't believe gay people should be allowed to get married. So legality doesn't change people's minds. You know, ex exposure and experience is what changes people's minds. So on some level, it brought the community together. And a lot, and a lot of levels, it brought the community together. Um, because I remember I came home from work and my roommate was telling me about this, uh, you know, and I'm chuckling just because of my response, was telling me about this gay cancer they heard about on television. And I just kind of looked at him and said, you know what, you watch just way too much television. You're making this up. I didn't believe him. Um, and I think at that point, you know, they had news on it. it you know, they started at five and then they started, then they re rebroadcasted at six. So I caught the six o'clock news and they talked about that. And I was like, oh my God, this is really real. Um, that was 1980. Um, and at that point, it was much more about the coast. There was New York, San Francisco, Chicago, um, Atlanta, uh, San Diego. And we really hadn't seen that many cases here. But I, it, it, it rallied the community and it actually rallied the, the medical community and the health community to, to kind of set things up before it hit here. Um, and that was, they had a whole HIV clinic at the, at the, at the um, Burnett and King Health Department. Um, and actually that was, that. <laughs> there was a friend of mine this was a couple of years ago. Um, he was talking about having um, an STD. And he's like, I don't have any money to go to the doctor. And I said, well, go to the clinic. I was like, what clinic? I said, like, you don't know about the free clinic? <laughs> they didn't know anything about that. And I was kind of like, oh my God, it was like a social, it was a social event. I mean, to go to the free clinic to get your, you know, get your STD, your, your STI test done. Because um, that's where we went for healthcare. Because people didn't necessarily tell their doctors that they were gay, so they would just go to the clinic and get that stuff taken care of. Um, so they, they developed a whole HIV um, program there uh, with the Cincinnati Health Department. Um, UC developed some support groups for people who are HIV positive. Um, I was one of the uh, facilitators for one of, for one of those groups. Um, and this was also about the time that, well, AVOC was, was already started. Um, Caracol came about. Can you explain AVOC? Oh, um, AIDS Volunteers of Cincinnati, which later became Stop AIDS. Um, and it was uh, an AIDS service organization that provided people with options. Because at that particular point in time, you know, people didn't live long. If they lived three weeks after their diagnosis, they lived a long time. So we spent a lot of time. I'm sorry? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you remember when AVOC started? Oh, God. 82, maybe? Because um, I remember it was, I mean, again, and this was in the 80s, there, there were no signs. There was a red dot on the door in this building of Central Parkway, and that's how you knew that that was AVOC's office. Um, and they did case management. They helped people get medication. And so, you know, the whole whole age regime was, was, was regimen, I should say not regime, but regimen was, was a whole lot different back then. Um, because AZT, the medication, I mean, it was, insurance didn't pay for any of this stuff. It was cost prohibitive for people to get it. It was, poison to your system, um, but it was the only medication people had. So, you know, if people were getting care at home, um, they didn't flush the medicine down the toilet. You kept the medicine and you took it down to AVOC and if people needed medication, that's where they got their medication. Or if you knew somebody who needed medication, didn't have the money, then you took the medicine from your friend who died or, or whoever, or people would, would share medicine. Um, those types of things. So it, 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 it kind of created a, a little community. 
um, in terms of, of caregivers, um, providing support and things like that. Um, Holmes Hospital was the AIDS hospital at that particular point in time. So we would have, you know, you would have um, situations where people were at homes, but it, be, it would become a little, um, you know, you'd bring food, <laughs> you'd bring stuff because you're not going to be there for a while. So, you know, you'd sit there and you'd talk and you'd play cards and you, 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 there was this, this, this little, you know, support network that we provided for one another there in the hospital. Whether we, and sometimes whether we knew the patient or not, um, we still provided that support for, if it wasn't for the patient, for their spouse or their boyfriend or, and sometimes for their parents because people weren't out then. And when they got their diagnosis, not only did they have to tell their parents that they were AIDS, that they, were, that they had AIDS, but they also came out of the closet. So that was a lot of, there was a lot of, of time and energy spent helping parents and family members process that. I mean, just, a lot. Um, a friend of mine, um, he was one of the first people that I diagnosed. Um, and I remember him coming to me and telling me that he had decided he wasn't going to take his, his uh, AZT anymore because it was just really making him sick. Um, he says, you can't tell my mother because, you know, she wanted him to, to um, well, she wanted him to live. Um, <laughs> but I also remember we were sitting in the hospital and he he calls me and says, you've got to go to my apartment. I'm like, why? And he says, my parents are going over <laughs> to clean up my apartment. There's a bag in the closet that has my toys in it. And I don't want my parents finding my toys. <laughs> but it, that, that's all what a lot of it was. About, yeah. yeah, of all things to worry about. Because, you know, it, I think it's one thing to, it, it's kind of like my mom. Yeah. On paper is one thing, but then when the reality of it hits, it's a whole different ball game. You know, coming in with a boyfriend is one thing, but you know, finding a, a bag of your son's dildos in his closet is just, you know, <laughs> probably wasn't on his his agenda for that day. And I mean, I knew the guy's dad; he was a nice guy. So you know, I went over to his apartment. You know, and his parents were already there. <laughs> And I'm standing there talking. I'm trying to be discreet, looking around, like, okay, where's this bag? <laughs> where, 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 yeah, where is it? And his dad walks up to me <laughs> and hands me this bag. And he says, I think you're looking for this. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was. <laughs> and I, you know, and you look back at that stuff, and it was funny at the time. I was when I when I went, I took it back over to the hospital. They was like, "Well, here, here's your bag." I said, "Well, I don't want it." And I was like, "Well, why do you want me to go over there and get it?" I said, "Well, I didn't want him to get it." I was like, "What do you want me to do with it?" He's like, "Well, you take them." And I'm like, "What am I going to do with your toys?" And I was like, "That's not our relationship. No." So I'm throwing these things away. Um, and along that same line, when when he died, he uh, this, he wanted to be cremated, and so I, I arranged for the cremation. Um, and we were the night before his his uh, service, you know, we're getting everything together we're at a friend's house, um, and you know, I bought an urn to put the ashes in, and I didn't know anything about people being cremated, um, so I opened up the the box, and here's this you know big bag of ashes, and so I took the top off the urn, and I'm trying to put the the bag in the in the urn. And there's too much air. And I said, well, I'll just, you know, undo the bag and, and let the air out. <laughs> well, I, and there was my friend, the friend who died, his brother-in-law. There was several of us sitting in the room. And I, and I pushed on the bag to push the air out. Well, I didn't, you know, I didn't know the consistency of ashes. This big flume of ashes just flew up in the air. <laughs> I jumped and screamed. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> it, I mean, there was, it was everywhere. <laughs> and we're sitting there just cackling. And I think it was comic relief, but we're just sitting there just laughing our heads off. And it's like, you cannot tell his mom <laughs> that we did this. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? We got the, all these ashes. So I went and got a dustpan and a, and a, and a wisp room. And I'm sweeping all these things up and I, I put them in the plants and I was like, well, you know, the plants will grow in this. And when he spent the night here, this is where he slept. So it's very appropriate that he would be in the plant. So he will always be in this room. <laughs> but 
I will. I, I always, I, I always remember that. But I think that you know, it, it helped build the community, and I think it kind of solidified and 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 built some relationships that otherwise we wouldn't have had. Um, and it wasn't always about uh, taking care of people; it was about providing support for partners, husbands. You know, having to figure out um, logistics in terms of you know what was going to happen to the houses and belongings and things like that. And sometimes I, you know, I realized that we lost so much history during that time. And because the stuff got tossed because families didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. you know, and I go up into my attic and I've got boxes of old advocates. I've got boxes of old, you know, porn magazines and, 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 and you know, local gay newspapers that are, are out of circulation. I mean, there's just a lot of history here in, in my attic. Um, but I think about the stuff that got tossed that, you know, we'll, we will never see again. Or, you know, we're going to be at, you know, some flea market somewhere. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, why am I in, you know, Jackson, Mississippi? <laughs> uh, I don't know why I pulled that out of the, my air, but out of the air, but... Um, well, I'm trying. I, 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 well, those years, you know, in the '90s, we were on Fountain Square, um, at least for the rallies. Now, you know, the festivals. That's. The, I think those were the years that they took place at the dock, <laughs> um, which you know, we were. I was part of those in terms of plan, setting those up and planning them. You know, dunking booth. I remember, you know, a couple dunking booths raising money for Pride. Um, you know, those types of things. Um, but it really didn't impact Pride that much. I mean, it's. Pride was not the event and not the size that it is now. I mean, it just was not. Okay. And it was, it, 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 comparatively, um, it really wasn't well attended necessarily. I mean, if we, we didn't have thousands of people. I mean, if we had 100 people, we had a lot. Um, you know, people didn't want to show their faces. And I remember one Pride where, and, and being the president of the, the Mental Health Association, there were two people that were helping me set up. We were, we were on Fountain Square, we were setting up the stage, and I happened to, and I was doing something in the back, and I happened to look up, and there's these two guys from my group in disguises, you know, the, the glasses the, with, the, with the nose and the mustache trying to disguise themselves. And I'm like, seriously? And I walked over to them, and I was like, if I can pick you out of a crowd, and I don't know who you are, I can guarantee you that your family even with those things on, we'll be able to tell who you are. So give it up. I mean, I, I don't have a problem challenging people. Well, I don't walk up to strangers on the street and do that. Let me, let me, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me um, be clear about that. But it's much more in terms of people that I know and I have some relationship with. I don't, I don't have a problem challenging them on that stuff. And it's like, you're really being silly. And your mental health professionals. I think that was the part that was really the most irritating to me. It's like, you're trying to tell people and give people an idea on how to feel good about themselves and you're hiding who you are. That makes no sense to me. It's like, why would you do that? I mean, I, and I still don't get that. And there's still people, there are still gay people, gay therapists who do that. It's like, why? That's just, that's just, that's just a lot of work. I mean, who, that, and it's not worth it. You know, because eventually people are going to find out exactly who you are. You know, so, um, but yeah, it really didn't, at least from my perspective, it didn't impact pride that much. Um, I think if anything, for me, it probably took away from what I could do for pride because we were providing, uh, well, you know, at that time I was also in graduate school. I mean, there was just a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but I, in terms of, of being able to participate in pride because, well, I was in graduate school and also, you know, being able to, to provide care and stuff like that for people. Um, so pride was not a priority at that particular point in time for me and for a lot of other people either. Marriage equality was big for some people, but it was not a big deal for me. It was never on, it was never on the agenda. And so it's kind of like, okay, I think they're, you know, I would be, I was much more concerned about racism in the community than people getting married. You know, it's just kind of like we got, there are other things that we need to be dealing with besides marriage, but okay, this is where we are. Um, and did the community change? 
Not really. Um, I, I, I think for some people it was a big deal. For others, it's kind of like, okay, we can get married now. Let's let's let us go have brunch. Um, you know, and I and I get, and I guess for me, I, I get the legality of it in terms of being able to, to you know, pass on your wealth or you know, make sure that if something happens that you know your your husband or, or wife or partner doesn't get kicked out on the street and stuff like that. In terms of the legalities of it, but you know, you had a legitimate relationship even without marriage equality. As long as you believe that you have a legitimate relationship, you have a legitimate relationship. And you know, that, that, that piece of paper gives you legal rights. That's the only thing it does. Um, but as far as, as, as you know, leveling up your relationship or making your relationship on par, you know, and having been a therapist, it's like the divorce rate is like 53% and you all are wanting to get involved in this for what reason? You know, what are you going to, what, what are we going to do any differently than straight people are doing that's going to make this, um, the divorce rate go down, you know, and I talk to people who have, who gay people who've gotten married. I know gay people who've gotten married and now they're getting, you know, getting divorced and they're really upset. Oh, you know, we were supposed to not, it's like, well, you know, people get divorced, you know, it, it happens. Um, and gay people get divorced. Um, so, you know, it, it, it kind of comes with the territory, but, you know, but they feel bad because they feel like they, they, they failed. Um, you know, they've done something wrong, but I was like, you know, I've worked with straight couples that they're the exact same way when their marriage doesn't work out. They feel like they failed. They've done something wrong. But my, my take on that is that everything has its life. And, you know, people say till death do us part. And I said, well, death doesn't necessarily have to be a physical death. It could just be the death of the relationship, you know, and, 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 and who tells you, you know, and it, it would be like, well, who, who make is the one rules anyway. It's like, and are they working? And if they're not working, why do you, why do you, the numbers of people who feel like they're failures because they're not living up to this standard arbitrary standard that somebody is making up about what marriage is supposed to be like. And I'm like, why would you beat yourself up over something, beat yourself up over something that they can't even do? So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pontificate. I think the current pride, I think the way that pride is set up currently, the community is kind of limiting itself because I think that it's important to celebrate our milestones and it's certainly important to celebrate how far we've come and you know, who we are and those types of things. Um, but we also need to look at, particularly with all the stuff that's going on around us, you know, what's gonna happen when shit goes down? You know, having Debbie Gibson at the microphone singing you know, her old songs is not gonna make me feel safe. I mean, and it's not going to make them feel safe either. So what are you doing to, 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 to ensure and to shore up the safety of the people who live in the community? And, you know, that, that's not something that's happening with this particular pride. I think that, um, oh my God, this is, I'll probably get banned from the community for this, but um, you know, pride needs to be about gay people or, or, or queers. Let me put it that way. And I use queer in, in, in an all-inclusive term because, I, you know, the, yeah. Uh, but I just don't feel like sitting here with LB, B, and just I, I stumble over the letters. So I'll just say queer. Um, I think that um, we need to be careful to not ignore the stuff that's happening in front of us because we want to feel good about who we are. Um, and you know, it, and I don't have a problem that, you know, people, oh, you know, it's kid friendly and it's all inclusive. Allies need to be able to come, blah, blah, blah. If I would not have a problem if pride did not have kids or allies, because I think that, you know, there are times that it's important for us to be able to celebrate our own and be able to be in our own space and be able to be able to 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 celebrate ourselves without depending on other forces or other things outside of ourselves to provide us with with um, 
pats on the back and tell us we're wonderful people. That that needs to come from here. And the only way that that's, well, I shouldn't say the only way, but one of the surefire ways that it will come from here is if it's, if it's coming from here with people who share that experience and share that same energy, if that makes any sense. Um, so I, I would like to see them expand that a little bit. I think that, you know, it's gotten a little bit more, well, it's gotten corporate. And so from that standpoint, there are um, limitations in terms of what you can, can and cannot do. Um, you know, there are, you know, some of the organizations, it's almost like they've whitewashed it and they sex washed it, pride. You know, when I hear the pride organizers, well, we can't have kink and leather people in the, in the parade. I'm like, you, do you understand that kink and leather people led the parade and they're the reasons why we have, you know, dikes on bikes? They, they, were, they were the police. They were the ones that kept the protesters away from us. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, they walked up and down the street and told people off. And it, not the, the glitter, I have to be very careful, the people that we have, the incarnation that we have right now is not the same as it was back in the 70s. It was very much a, of, of a political group, very much of a, a in-your-face political group. Um, and they, they weren't making nice. They weren't playing nice. And they were, it was a protest. They were on roller skates. And they, you know, they didn't have all the glitter. They were actually in, you know, nuns hats on roller skates, you know, skating around, um, you know, telling the protesters, you know, to go fuck off. <laughs> That's not what they're doing now. So, you know, it, it, it oh God, they're probably going to stone my house now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, and I think part of me, kind of, when, you, when you've been around as long as I've been around as long as I have, and you've um, experienced and worked with, with some people, it's like this incarnation and some of the people that are involved in those things and what, how they're building themselves. And it's like my experience of you and what you're putting in the same thing. And, you know, you, have you seen, you know, and she wrote that book about what you like and it's like you know what I, I i could sit down and write a book like that about you know what people say that they're like but then what they're really like and just in terms of just you know their their, their attitude towards people of color in the community just in terms of their own you know how how far they're willing to go or not go um for people who don't look like them you know i i i'm always a little disappointed with some of the groups in terms of like the Black Lives Matter protests and some of the racial protests and things like that. People aren't showing up for those. You know, they'll, they'll talk a good game, but as far as like showing up for the protest or the, or the walks or things like that. And, and I did not go to the Black Lives Matter, the, the, the most recent ones, you know, where they, where they painted the, the um, spot in front of City Hall and things like that. Because again, it was one of those things where I, I, I wanted to go and I sat there and I was like, if something goes down, I don't think I can get away fast enough. I mean, it was just more, it's like, uh, and I was frustrated with that and really upset. It's like, but I also know my energy now and it's just like, uh, what, you younger people can go do this. You run faster than I do. You know, I, I just, no, I can't do it. Um, and, and that's, then that's actually been a hard thing, um, to accept and to adjust to. And it's like, really, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't want to do that. Any it's not that I don't want to do that anymore, but you know, it's like my, my spirit's telling me, mm, you don't want to do that. It's like that, 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 that will not end well for you. Um, but I, and I think that, well, and I think the other thing that we, for pride is we need to include older people in pride because it is not, it is not for older people. You know, they have the tent and they have the air, you know, and if you've been in, you, well, you work pride. So, you know, that tent with one of those air conditioners, if you get, after you get 15 people in there, you don't have air conditioning anymore. So, you know, I, I just don't want to sit in the tent and, you know, and I, I don't want to be down on, on, um, the serpentine wall and on the river for, you know, eight hours in the sun. You know, what, what is there to do 
in our community that would appeal to people my age because I'm going to say I'm just as gay as I, as I was in my 20s. Actually, I'm probably more gay at, at, at pushing 70 than I was at 22. Uh, but with the experience and, but those things don't appeal to me as a gay person anymore. You know, people change and we seem to have a, a, an idea. This is what gay people are, but we leave older gay people off the table. Um, and, you know, and I hear this push about kids and, you know, youth and, you know, and I, and I call it our raise money speeches. You know, we have to talk about it, the plight of youth because we need to raise money for programs and services. I get that. I was a social worker. I, you know, I've been the director of agencies. I understand all of that. But at the same time, um, there's people at the other end of the rainbow who are experiencing the exact same issues. Hunger, being unhoused, unemployment, mental illness, but how can you, can anybody tell me the statistics of the people that show up at the, at, well, I almost said drop-in center, but you know, the, the, the homeless shelters or things like that, or even living under the bridges. How many of them are older gay people? You don't know. You know how many people are younger gay people because you ask the question, but for older gay people, you don't ask that. You, you don't ask the question. We are there. We're sitting there and people are ignoring it because, you know, when you look at, you know, it's almost depressing when you read the, the information about aging in the gay community. You know, 50% are going to be living by themselves. They don't have kids. You know, 45% are going to be living in poverty. You know, people go back in the closet. So it paints this very bleak picture about what my future is is going to be looking like and but people aren't addressing that and if if you start to talk about it, it's like well it's it's almost like people have, you had your shot and i'm like mm, i'm still shooting mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i'm you know i'm still here i'm still functional um and why wouldn't you look at things that are happening at this end of the rainbow because one thing is going to be, one thing is for certain. Not everybody is going to be trans. Not everybody's going to be bi. Not everybody's going to be non-binary. But everybody, if you're lucky, you're going to age. Everybody's going to age. So at some point in time, you're going to have to deal with this system that I'm dealing with right now. And I, you know, I kind of think to myself, it's like, okay, where I was born on this wheel. Maybe this is my task in terms of being continue to be that pioneer in terms of looking at, because, you know, my idea of aging is very different than people's idea of, excuse me, aging um, 20 years ago. It's like, I, I'm not ready to stop. You know, I retired 10 years ago and it's driving me absolutely crazy. I just have too much energy. Um, I you know, can't sit still and, and, and I'm not, I'm not a, a hyper person. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, it, 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 it's nothing, you know, I'm not anxious or, or anything like that. It's just like, I have to, 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 you know, be sitting and just, you know, my thumbs and, you know, watching, you know, Golden Girls reruns. Um, <laughs> it's not how I, 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 I want to spend my, my old age. Um, you know, and how, do, how, do, how do we get more people at this end of the range? We had a, um, you know, it was part of a project uh, that a friend of mine, an artist, was doing for the health department in terms of getting people to come, uh, younger African American men, uh, to come in and get tested for HIV. And I just sat there and I was, you know, watching this and hearing the things uh, that they were talking about. And I just looked at them and I said, "You do understand that us old guys are having sex too, right? You know, these us old men, we are fucking each other like nobody's business." And, but you don't hear talk about the STI rates among older gay men or the rate, newer rates of HIV among older gay men or, you know, the, the you know, chlamydia and all the other, was it H, HPV, uh, all the other things that come up. Uh, you, they don't talk about that in terms of people my age, um, which is really unfortunate. And, you know, I, I would think, and, you know, ideally that if... Um, they engaged us in some of this dialogue and in some of these campaigns, you might get younger people 
to get tested because if they see us doing it and, and we've lived through all that and, and we're still here, um, then maybe they would get the idea that they need to do that too. And it's not about sex shaming. It's about taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, have as much sex as you want, protection or not protection. I don't really care, but you need to have the information and then you can make an informed decision about how you want to proceed with that. Uh, but again, people my age also need that same information. And it's like, are you not reading the, the, the statistics of the rates of STIs in nursing homes? I mean, it has skyrocketed because people are having sex, but we're not going to put them on the campaign. We're not going to put them in, you know, we're not include them on the billboards uh, because, you know, old people having sex. So there's a whole message about, you know, what's, what's attractive, you know, what's not attractive, what's appropriate. Well, you shouldn't be having sex. Well, why shouldn't I have sex? You know, I just, I liked it when I was in my 20s. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, you know, you want to have that contact with other people. Um, you know, and don't shame me for that. And don't, you know, don't shame me because I'm older. I can't know anything about this. You know, it just, it, it, and trust me, it sneaks up on you. It's like, um, when did, when did I get to be 70? How did this happen? I was 25 yesterday and here I am at 70 years. Well, I'm not 70 yet, but I'm turning 70 this year. This is my, uh, I'm 69 this year. And I said, so take that number and imagine this is this is my 69th year so do with that do with your imagination what you will with what i'm going to do with that number so but i but i i think more so now it's much more about it's like that juncture it's like being able because it's, it's like the yin and the yang 69 is the yin and yang to me um so it's at that it's that point where it's, it's that juncture being able to look at your past and and you know come to some grips with it, uh, peace with it, so you can be able to move forward. You know, so that, that's really how I'm looking at 69, is to be able to, you know, I told somebody, it's like, I need to offload some things to be able to upload new things. And that's where I am at 69. And, that, and, that, and that's really what that means for me. Um, because, you know, again, I'm, I'm about to venture into uncharted territory, because there's no roadmaps at this end of gay life, other than, you know, disappearing. And, I'm not disappearing anytime soon. So we're, we're blazing a new trail and, and realizing that, you know, I, I'm lucky in that I get to sit in the shade of trees that I planted a long time ago. And I get to enjoy this with, well, it's kind of a bittersweet because some of those same people that helped plant those trees are not here. So I get to sit in the shade that, enjoy it for myself and enjoy it for them. But I also understand that in aging and those types of things, that that is not going to be able to sit in because you know I'm 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 not going to live another seventy years, you know if I do that's kind of scary, um, but but then you know I have longevity lives is in my family. I have an aunt that's ninety three. You know her grandmother lived to be one hundred and four. My great grandfather lived to be ninety two. So who knows? Um, but you know. I, and people come out of the closet at, at all ages. You know, I had a friend who was a priest, uh, came out of the closet at 80. And it's like, you know, what his interests were at 80 would be very different than somebody who was 35. Man, there needs to be options available for people who are not in their 30s. And I think, you know, I was talking with somebody who was 30 and, you know, they're feeling like a dinosaur when they talk to 15 and 16 year olds who were coming out of the closet. And it's like, oh God, if they think you're a dinosaur, I'm like petrified wood. <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> but, and you know, the person that I worked with on Friday, you know, they were 30. Um, and I was struck by how similar our activist spirits were, um, which was actually kind of nice. So, you know, I think that, you know, pairing up, pairing older people with younger people, you know, that's the intersection that we really need to be looking at and, and being able to, to build the community and to be able to move forward. You know, their energy, their ideas and things like that. But then the wisdom of, you know, how do you go about doing that to to make sure that it's it's there's some longevity to that. 
you know, as I tell people, it's like, you know, you can give me a hard time and tell me I don't know what I'm doing. But, you know, there are the Cincinnati Men's Corps, Care Cole, um, the Bowling League, and the Sports League. I was part of organizing all of that. And here we are almost 40 years later. They're still here. So you need to pay attention to that. Well, but even with that, I tell people who are, who are, who are, and they're doing a lot of things. It's like, pace yourselves. You're 30 years old. And if you're going at this speed at 30, you will never make it to 50. And and not meaning they're necessarily going to die, but, you know, in terms of just being able to, 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 to function and not feel burnout and not feel overwhelmed and not have, you know, not develop bitterness. It's like pace yourselves. You know, the world is, is, is not going anywhere. Um, you know, and, and you need to be able to take care of yourself. You need to be able to step out of this, this mess and this craziness and this chaos and, and lick your wounds and take care of yourself, build a life, have relationships, have friends, get married, plant trees, you know, have a flower bed, you know, get a dog, you know, all those things that, you know, so that you have a life because, you know, if you're not careful, your activism will become your life. And you'll, you will end up, I mean, at some level, I mean, that's exactly what's happened. Um, you know, here I am, and it's just like, okay, I spent a lot of time doing this stuff, but I'm, yeah, I'm hurting. That has anything to do with being single, but at the same time, it's like when you give, when you give it all away, you don't, you don't replenish it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, being able to take the time now at 69 to be able to replenish that, it's like, don't wait till you're 69. You know, do that as you go along on your journey. I mean, that that would be the the the, the sage advice that I would give to people at this point. It's like, yeah, just pace yourself. You, nothing's worth all that.